Thank you. Thank you very much, Marion. Um, it's so fantastic to be here. It really is. I mean, I'm so used to doing online conferences and workshops. I'm, I have to get out of the habit of telling you all to meet yourselves at the, at the beginning. Um, it, it's, it, it's really fantastic to be doing a, a, a sort of live, in-person what's happening in Black British history. It's, it's lovely to be here. Um, I'm, I was for, for a number of years director of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. I'm now at the Institute of Historical Research, which is also co-sponsoring this, this really important series. It's our 14th. Uh, doesn't, doesn't time fly? We've always done, we've tended to do one in London, one outside London, so we can, we can kind of build up links with local networks of expertise in this area. And this has really been a labour of love by my colleagues at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, Miranda Kaufman uh, and Michael Lovett Ewell, um, who, who've um, been organising this throughout, throughout the years. And it's been a delight to work with the University of Bangor and our colleagues, Marion Gwynn, uh, Neris Bog and Sean Evans. Uh, sorry he can't be here today, but we, we all wish him a swift recovery, and Sean Williams. Um, uh, so, um, it's, a, it's a particular delight to be able to start this event with a keynote from Professor Charlotte Williams. And I think when, when, we, when we knew that Charlotte would take part, we, we, we knew this was going to be, we knew this was going to be great. Uh, she was the, the, the very first person we wanted to, to, to do this. Uh, Charlotte grew up in London, no, She's a graduate of Granbury University and now an honorary professor in the School of History, Philosophy and Social Sciences. She was until recently Professor of Social Work and Deputy Dean at Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology University in Australia. She is, as, as most of you will know, uh, the author of some highly influential works, including A Tolerant Nation, which explores diversity in Wales, and an award-winning memoir, Sugar and Slate, which won the Wales Book of the Year Award in 2003. She has recently been appointed by the Welsh Government to oversee the improvement of the teaching of Welsh BAME history. It's, it's so, um, it, it, it's wonderful, not, not just to have her speaking at this conference, but actually also listening to, to the really interesting research that's being produced in this, in this area. Because one thing that we have found over the years is that there is some fantastic work going on. And a lot of it is going on outside the university sector. That's what's so interesting about this field. So we've always tried our best to bring together people from, from a, a range of backgrounds, many of them independent scholars, and, and sort of from the museum and the teaching sector. So Charlotte, it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much. And over to you. This is a great invitation for me, and I'm really um, delighted. I'm a little bit scared to be speaking to you as a non-historian in a Black History Conference, but that, I think, indicates the reach of Black History and the significance of Black History to all of us. Um, I'm going to try and do my paper in a little bit more of an informal way, seeing as we're all friends mm -hmm. and colleagues. Um, okay, now more than ever before, histories have been popularised, personalised, the ownership and authorship of the past is being shared with new actors and stakeholders. The questions of who decides which histories to tell, who are the custodians of certain histories, and what types of power relations does the archive or and or the notion of heritage reveal? All of this is being interrogated in the way that Barna Hesse calls multicultural transruptions are riveting across uh, the disciplines. And in the past, 
the recording of history relied on academic writing and on disciplinary societies who were very good at policing the boundaries of the discipline. And now those learned societies are interrogating race and ethnicity in their own disciplines, including the underrepresentation of students and staff from minority backgrounds. And new and imaginative connections are being made across disciplines. So they're well into the business of breaking down the boundaries, the traditional boundaries between disciplines. And it may well be that the Black Lives Matter protests and campaign following the brutal murder of George Floyd acted as an accelerator to these developments, but these developments have been on their way for some considerable time. There's a sense in Wales of a critical turning point, and in welcoming you to Wales today, I want to give my answer to that question, what's happening in black history, and talk about developments here, and I want to say something about the significance of the changing political climate in Wales, exemplified perhaps by this new mandate on the teaching of black history in schools in Wales. I want to say a little bit of something about those effective dimensions of this revisionist moment, that the magic for those of us of lived experience in connecting with this past in this way knowing the where and the why of your existence and placing yourself in what we call our Penelope. Wales is taking multiculturalism beyond the metropolis to a consideration of elsewhere spaces and places. And then I want to say something about our responsibilities as what we might call citizen historians, we're non-academic uh, historians engaged in this more democratic scenario. And then finally, I'll just say something about the new University of Wales press series, Wales, Ethnicity, Wales in the World. So, as you uh, might have heard just now, I'm a policy person, and I've long been interested in the intersection between black history and social policy, social public policy, in terms of how the past is conceived, how it's mobilised, how it's interpreted. The term black history, ill-defined as it is, has increasingly found a place in contemporary public policy. And we only need to look at the Windrush scandal, the Brexit immigration debates, Black Lives Matter, and the memorials campaign, and the tussles over the curriculum at all levels of education. <laughs> We've all mobilised this terminology. And here, black history aids us to dismantle racial inequalities in the present. And Wales is a very interesting case study in this respect. The complexities of a subaltern Wales and its imperial role, tolerance and internationalism as proposed national sentiments, its skewing of the access, axis between centre and periphery, and its particular geographies of race, all inform contemporary public policy. In October 2020, our First Minister, Mark Raven, went on record as saying, Welsh history is black history, and black history is Welsh history. And he was responding to a long-standing and accelerated call for more attention to black history in the formal curriculum. Now, I've said I'm not an academic historian, but it was clear to me that what he was actually suggesting was a lot more than the interrogation of historiography. Because whilst the black history debates speak directly to matters of integrating and understanding the contributions of black people, to Wales over time. They also demand attention to long-standing and ongoing debates about national identity, the nature of Welshness, the aspirations of this young democracy towards inclusiveness. <coughs> and as the cultural theorist Stuart Hall tells us, 
these detours through the past are necessary to make ourselves anew. So the Black History Debate is a debate, of course, about nation, national belonging, culture, and development. And it's become iconic to the revisioning of Welsh society. A critical instrument of this endeavour has always been, is and all has always been, the national curriculum. And I can say proudly today that Wales is the first nation of the UK to make mandatory the teaching of black histories, of black perspectives in schools. Over the years, this last year, I've spoken a lot about the rationale for this development and the benefits of it to all pupils in Wales, not solely those from minority backgrounds, to all teachers in Wales, not solely those from minority backgrounds, and to all disciplines within the curriculum, not solely the arts and humanities. By making the curriculum more representative, perhaps we do greater justice to the history to the discipline of history itself. But my point here is that we are now poised to make black history accessible to all in Wales, to reach a much wider audience, to teachers, to parents, to pupils, in ways never before. And in the next five years, people will know the black <coughs> history of Wales here more than they do now. Schools are mandated, but this initiative to decolonise curricula is being felt across further education and across higher education, and going well beyond the interrogation of the Eurocentric rendering of history. The National Museum, the Arts Council, the Books Council, the Sports Council, many of our public institutions are outlining their strategies to in relation to redress and refreshed approaches to the future. We've seen the audit of public monuments, artefacts and street names, and we'll hear about that later from Gaynor. We've seen numerous reports, of course, on this shift, including the showcase statement of the Welsh Government in their race equality action plan, visioning an anti-racist Wales by 2030. None of this can happen or have impact without recognition of the past. What makes the First Minister's statement so compelling is his suggestion that we root this, these developments in Welsh history, in the social, cultural and economic development of Wales. And this is the evidence that has to be revisited and reworked in interpretations of black history are to have resonance and impact in public education. Along with my dear colleague Neil, who's here today, and Paul O'Leary, we've argued that much as the national consciousness of Wales likes to suggest a tolerant nation, the evidence, both historically and in the contemporary moment, cannot demonstrate any coherent approach to anti-racist thinking. So we challenge the notion of Welsh exceptionalism. The history of the matter tells us that majority Welsh identity has itself been bruised by racism and oppressions, as well as minority ethnic communities, and that this is both a pivotal point of alliance and of contradiction. Many Welsh nationalists of the 18th and 19th centuries readily identified with the plight of their imperial subjects on just such racialized grounds, but then held back from questioning imperialism itself. The history of the matter also reveals Welsh people's role in empire building, missionary trail that followed the roots of colonial expansion, deep lines of connection to the slave economy, settler colonialism, and the coal power that fueled colonial expansion. 
in short, global connections and interactions which should easily place Wales in its world, claiming its own responsibility in the sins and gains of the past, and easily qualify the fact that Welsh history is black history and black history is black history. The record of black history of Wales has emerged slowly over the last 20 years and be, can be constructed from a number of perspectives we, we've heard or, and will hear today, bottom up from the lives of individuals like John Assumption, Nathaniel Wells, Dorothy Bonaggi. Through portraits and through photographs, we have explored the archive of these individuals. Through the oral histories in the work of the Butte Town History and Arts Centre, and Neil P. Clare's localised accounts of Butte Town Life. Through institutions such as the Congo Stroke Africa Institute, through artefacts of our National Trust organisations, and by pursuing commodities like iron, coal, wool, slate, and by looking at cultural transformations, or indeed by tracking rates as a theme, as I do in social policy. We can usefully summon this history in contemporary debates to place and locate minority communities of Wales and to celebrate their contributions. History is animated by our lived experience. But here's the rub. Leaving aside those complicated questions about ownership and authorship and representation in history making, my fear is that black history has too often been constructed as just a number of fascinating little stories drawn from a crossway. A showcase of discrete artefacts and memorabilia resurrected within particular expressions of Kinevin without context, connection or critical exploration. We may be going local without going global. This is, of course, a very effective way of ensuring black history remains marginal in popular debate and within historiography. In a process of exoticizing or a process of decontextualizing, black history could too easily be seen as an interesting add-on, compartmentalized or listed as a part of a long list of specialised subjects. And I'm particularly concerned about this as we hand over now to the teachers, to the schools. This fact has allowed Wales to dodge attention to addressing the role of local, regional and national connections in the history of empire and colonialism, and cling to a safe set of stories that does not dislodge or unsettle the majority perceptions of a very white Wales. And I want to quote James's, James Phillips, James's clever article where he says, quote, interpretations of the lives of ordinary people cannot be pieced together effectively if those uncomfortable aspects of the puzzle are shied away from. Tracing the Clapper Journal's engagement with these themes and his reading of Welsh historiography. He bemoans both the past paucity of studies and looks to a, a new trajectory that includes us, the non-traditional producers of history, the activists, the campaigners, the artists and the cultural performers in a dialogue. Do I represent you correctly? <laughs> <laughs> but let me speak to that us. The citizen historian, as one of them, and, and, and one that wants to take um, responsibility. In our lay hands in particular, we're guilty of deploying such black histories as a salve for contemporary yearnings for belonging. When more substantially, we should address this as a matter of collective national identity. Not my history, but my history as part of a collective history. In our lay hands, we are guilty of defining X 
exclusive versions of black history as related to African and Caribbean diaspora, stopping short of more expansive definitions. We have to ask who are we leaving out? In our lay hands, we are guilty of failing to signal the complexities of the entanglements and contradictions in the relationship between Wales and its will. The mutualities, the exchange and the gift, as Robert Burroughs has taught me, um, that characterise these connections. So I'm not knocking our involvement, its importance or its incorporation into the enterprise of historiography. You heard I wrote The Sugar and Slate all those years ago. We are important communicators of those histories. We have an important role to play in challenging, bringing an effective dimension to these studies, a voice. Reclaiming our past is critical to our identities and our well-being. The joy we feel on recovery of that past and recognition. Those effective dimensions of history that need to be captured. We are significant to the opening up of the boundaries of the discipline, and we have an important role in literature, in writing the literature of our nation. So many of us are interested in these histories when we write to the literary way. And we have an important role in demanding a Welsh globalism that looks beyond nation. Black history transcends national boundaries, but we must assist in crafting that transnationalism that takes us, in Neil's words, beyond the narrative of Ireland or the gazetteer-style guide to the empire towards looking at cross-border connectivities. So I'm saying again, I'm not an academic historian. I recognise the trend to the de democratisation of history has both positive and negative impacts. If it means we're all users of history and that we can be involved in, in the knowledge building, then it's an important dimension of today's activism for racial equality. On the other hand, this revealing of the past by anyone and everyone, with little or no critical exploration or even understanding of the context of the facts, could potentially lead to a montage that discredits the very stories it seeks to promote. Were we to consider Wales and the world as the meta-narrative and robustly explore a transnational historiography, this would take us beyond that problematic of specific content, beyond the selecting of what or who exactly counts as black history how much and where, to those big themes of empire, imperialism, colonialism and globalisation that bind these perspectives and that concern us all, not just those from black communities. And that process is underway. Research, for example, by Chris Evans on Welsh involvement and financial gains from the slave trade and Daniel Williams' marvellous Black Skin Blue books and many others. We know that the slave ships that left Liverpool and Bristol needed a reservoir of labour and employment opportunities for sailors and ships captains were filled by Welsh crew. And we know that the mining of copper in Anglesey and its processing in Swansea serviced the operation of slavery in so many ways. These interconnections take us from Bethesda to Jamaica, slave, from Colin Bay to the Congo, students, from Dolgetfly to the southern states of the USA, wool, and so on. This is everyone's history, not just black people's history. An optimistic view is that in Wales we are less threatened by this questioning of the past in terms of national identity. And we're not aligned to the defensive and protectionist Little Britain visioning that is now the trope of Brexit England. In stark contrast, the current policy trajectory on race equality in Wales is evidence of an openness and a willingness to reshape Welsh identity. 
to open that dialogue and question, and to question as a matter of everyday citizenship. As World Writer nicely put it, we're not clinging to a traditional notion of here I, but we're crafting a Cambro futurism. So as we deconstruct, so also we must build. From the social intimacies of interracial marriage, the ebbs and flows of multiple migrations, to the analysis of industrial and economic development, to today's transnational and digital connections, there is a need to build a more robust framework for locating this refreshed look at the past. So, a few points uh, just to conclude. Rising to this radical agenda means backing against add-on tokenistic attention to putting a little black into white stream agendas. Let's turn the lens on whiteness itself. Let's navigate the complexities of democratizing potential within contemporary historiography. Let's actively promote narratives rooted in a refashioned idea of Welsh ways of life, exploring histories that make connections and develop symmetries. Seek out the potential of allyship that is evident in our past, for example, the solidarities of a strongly working class tradition in Wales. Look beyond host, minority, black, white, binary thinking. We can look to the past for examples of shared mobilisations, encourage and sponsor new groupings and alliances to form robust advocacy coalitions. And as academics, we need to take up the challenge of interdisciplinary approaches to ethnicity studies and transnational studies in Wales more seriously. And that's why we've launched this University of Wales Press series with just that ambition to map the field, extend the connections between history and social theory, between history and contemporary social policy, between history, arts and literature, draw on lived experience in a sophisticated interdisciplinarity that is essential to race studies. We need scholars prepared for reworking the colour blindness and power blindness of the archive. And we need to be look, look beyond national boundary to determine a Welsh studies reflective of those global connections, past and present. So let's follow the First Minister's sphere and embed black history in a refreshed Welsh history that speaks to Wales and the world. The Arthur Questions for five minutes? Yes, it's Okay, we'll do Sorry, I'm a bit premature, but I wanted to thank you so much, the oh, Arsenal Bar, um, and I yes. thought I would present you with oh my a Jonas Monklin, if I said that right, yes. Rose. Oh. Um, you know, Jonas Monklin has been our poster boy for this event, the first black Welsh gardener. Uh, he has a fascinating life story, recently being included in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, if anyone wants to read, but I thought you might oh, like to have that in that your garden. that is gorgeous. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. And yes. They've, apparently they've planted the roses oh, round I haven't it seen now. It. So uh, we'll have to, when, when it blossoms, we'll have to go. And wow. Have I've got it. my own one. Oh, oh, lovely. Thank yeah. you. Thank yeah. you so much. So we, we, we've got ten. We've got ten minutes for for questions, and uh, the floor is open. So please. Uh, yes. strategy in place now that anybody in your organisations could now get involved in? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, 
If you're talking specifically about thinking about how we're approaching the curriculum, mm -hmm. we're, we're, working on, we're working that out. And we're working it out with a lot of different partners um, right across the UK as well as within Wales. And also I've been involved with a group now that we're looking at the GCSEs and how we'll, they'll have to change in order to accommodate this mandate. So, yeah, I don't think we have got any blueprint yet, but um, there are an awful lot of ideas around about how we should take this forward. And I think what I was trying to say was, the only way we're going to get to a good range of ideas is by involving an awful lot of people in that, you know, pupils, parents, as well as um, activists, and, you know, uh, so, yeah, it's a, a work that's ongoing. I mean, your, your, your question speaks to something I was going to ask about, because we, we were talking earlier, I was saying we ran a, a witness seminar um, uh, earlier in the week on the history working group from the first national curriculum, 1989 to 90. And they were saying, there was someone from the, the Her Majesty's Inspectorate there, um, said that of all the subjects, they got more feedback for history than for anything else. Mm. I mean, history is the kind of, it seems to be that discipline where we all feed in our hopes and sense of identity. And it, but, but in the current climate, where you know, the, the, the British government seems to be wanting to fight culture wars, isn't it sort of slightly tricky terrain? Is it easier in Wales, do you think, to, to oh. make those sorts of reforms? You sort of suggested it was. I think it is because we've had the first minister and the government's mandate. You know, yeah. I mean, a mandate's a tricky concept, but actually they're saying we want to see this, we yeah. want to see it rolled out, we want to see it demonstrated. Yeah. And that's a great lever. Yeah. There's also been a, a, a real sort of interrogation of the teaching of Welsh history, which yeah. has also been very marginalised. Yeah. And, and that also provides a kind of boost and a bolster to this um, initiative being rolled out. So I think the, you know, the wind's behind us. Yeah. It does feel like that. Yeah. And I think uh, when we spoke to teachers and we spoke to pupils, there was a very open door and a willingness and people wanted to learn and they wanted guidance and yeah. you know they're asked they're up for it kind of thing yeah. so we'll yeah. we'll see Good just luck. to go back to you we have obviously got the report that we did which i can send you the link for on the curriculum but um now we're doing this sort of how is it implemented and i think this is the critical phase because often reports just you know you know what happens to them so staying with the government and working on the implementation, I think, is the most important phase now. Please, then this question we have. Yeah. Just to sort of supplement that, the other difference, I think, in Wales is that Wales has developed a anti-racist Wales action plan. Yeah. And the title of that plan has changed into anti-racist yeah. rather than the race equality action plan that was. Oh. And, it, and it is because the, it's supposed to be an action, it's about change, mm. so that education that sits, uh, I think, at the heart of it, is actually supported, so the changes proposed mm. are supported by the changes in the other institutions and organisations mm. around it. Mm. So, you know, it's embedded in a wider, in a wider field, yes, yeah. but even more, the, the need to include Others and uh, but but I think mm. we'll get there mm. and it will be good when it's finished. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, good, good. Can I can I just can I can just come in? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, and then we'll... I teach at secondary school in West Oxfordshire. Yeah. Um, <coughs> hello. Um, okay. And I'm 61. And when I was at school, along with uh, certain Boris Johnson, who came up with him, obviously I went to somewhere <laughs> in Manchester. Um, we had textbooks that were 50 years old. We had all our geography maps were 50 <coughs> years old. Yeah. The world was a pink British Empire. Yeah. We were told by Rome, do you remember the, you know, the, the sort of glories of the British Empire, yeah. um, churches, <coughs> English speaking peoples, and so on. And um, when I grew up, I realised that this was a load of crap. <laughs> yeah. um, my father was at a little private school somewhere. 
he believed all this to his dying day and got furious when he started laughing at the Queen of England song in the 80s. That's the problem you've got. Um. Um, I teach the kids, I say, when I was at school, mm. this wasn't. The only thing that was mentioned in the slave trade was the 1830s when we stopped it. Oh. Um, uh, and not the reasons behind that. Yeah. Uh, that was how we were taught the Holocaust as well. It was just, oh, we went to Belson and thought he died. And you've got a lot of people in Westminster who utterly cling to that. Mm. And it's so refreshing to hear about Mark Graham. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but in West Oxfordshire, we just yeah. do what we want anyway. Um, I've not seen Jason Todd for a couple of years because uh, he does the PGC one. But he's been fantastic and um, helping us to just introduce it. Yeah. But it's just so awful that it has to be all this clandestine. Mm. You make an interesting point though when you say we just do what we want mm. because one of the things that we've been discussing now yeah. is we're handing over to the professional, we're handing over to the practitioner, but you still want coherence. There's no, there's no coherence at all. Yeah. No, I mean, I guess it's a sort of underground movement really because we have West Oxford Learnish Partnership where we meet up with all the other schools and all the historians agree. Um, you know, we're trying to, you know, it's, it's a vet for the thing, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, they're very interesting times, but mm. uh, you do need leadership because education is all important, isn't it? Mm. It's, it's literally, you've got to start with the kids. Absolutely. Yeah. It's time for a final quick question. We've got yeah, a good segue here. Uh, into this, um, in, within your, within your um, talk, you were talking about this democratization of historiography and this, yeah. at this local level of creation of stories and, yeah. and at a local level and I guess similar I guess to schools is this <clears throat> but if a local um, history group is creating black stories from their locale yeah where is this kind of um, oversight or coherency as you just said um, and I wondered if you could just elaborate on um, your hopes or maybe your caution for yeah. this kind of that fear, that is my, as you can hear, the slight tension in the, what I'm saying, because the new curriculum is underpinned by this concept, Kenevi, which means the place I'm from and I belong and my local. And, and that's lovely. I think that is a good uh, starting point. But then I begin to get worried because, you know, I've mentioned this to you, Dan, have I? I get a bit worried because I hear, oh, you know, the John Assumption Rose. Um, well, what was John Assumption doing there? And why? And well, we'll hear later much more about that. But do you know what I mean? It, it is very difficult. And so we're trying, I asked this question of the Ministry of Education just last week, what's going to ensure coherence and coordination of this? And he, you know, very nicely talked about peer-to-peer -peer and sharing best practice and all of those things that you would imagine he'd say and the, you know there are national <coughs> forum and shaping hub which is the portal for teachers but it is it's the thing that i'm worrying about um, and i think we've got to have strong alliance with academic historians and i keep saying this and the, in fairness the welsh government have asked for all your names and you know we put names forward of academic historians um, and it just sort of reminded me of when I wrote to Ruth Slade I well I spoke to Matt but I wasn't so bad with the right? but I, I didn't actually think oh I need a historian mentor to help me when I'm writing I just knew Mary and so I could talk to her about it but um, I think that's what we have to be wary of you know it's nice that those stories were handed to me and I was able to integrate them in my work, but um, I really probably needed a better alliance if, looking back with the story. So I think that will be the thing that will help us. Miranda, do you want a final, final question? Um, well, I was just hoping, especially with your intervention, which is quite interesting, I was wondering, like, well, I, in a way, I can, I'm projecting aspirations onto you, but I suppose the question is, do you share my aspirations? <laughs> that, 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 like, the work that you're doing can yeah. actually be picked up by teachers in yeah. England and in Scotland. We and, desperately need it. You know, like, it, I mean, in a way, I'm, like, excited that you're doing the homework, like, <laughs> set by the Welsh government. Yeah. And then once that work is out there, then maybe, like, teachers yeah. across the rest of Britain can, like, pick it up and... And run with it. Yeah. And do you think? Do you think that's the sort of way forward? Because 
yeah, Westminster's definitely not going to help anyone anytime yeah. soon. Well, the funny thing is, in Wales, we often feel marginal to that kind of big dialogue, but people have been reaching out, and I was just telling Philip that the National uh, Educators Union and Runnymede have approached us Great. in Wales to say, we're now responding to the um, is it inclusive communities response that the government did to the SIL report, and they're looking at the history curriculum. Um, and making recommended and running me have done loads of work haven't they interesting as have you um, so yeah I think that there is a willingness for us to have a, a conversation across the nations home nations and, and yeah I'll be shouting about it from the treetops <laughs> Great. well we've got to move on to our first panel now but this has been a fantastic way of starting the, the conference so thank you so much. <laughs> for following Charlotte because she is just so superb in every single thing that, that she does. For a non-historian, I can't think of anybody who better sums up the way for historians in the world. So thank you very, very much indeed. Now, um, uh, my name's Marion Gwynn. I'm chairing the first <coughs> session here. Now, Professor Williams is excellent keynote presentation has reminded us of the work that is currently taking place across Wales in engaging with diversity, <coughs> tackling racism and exploring the past through a more honest, reflective and especially in Wales a proactive lens as Charlotte has made very, very clear. And I'm delighted to chair the conference's first panel which I think will get us off to a racing start. Its title is New Developments in Welsh Black History. Our speakers come from a range of backgrounds and each has a very wide range of interests. <coughs> but one of the things that they all have in common is that they are all heritage specialists. And this is important because it leads directly on to the points that Philip and Charlotte were making about the democratisation of knowledge and of history in the way we tell our stories because they are the ones who are responsible in various ways of engaging directly with the public. Now, not all of them will be speaking about their heritage work in their papers today, but it is reassuring to know that their expertise in black history feeds into public knowledge of the past in Wales through the work that they do on a day-to-day -day level. Our first speaker is Peter Alexander. Peter is an independent heritage consultant. He was awarded a master's degree in heritage management at Bangor University. He worked for the National Trust for many years and was curatorial manager for Denbyshire before working as an independent consultant on collections management and education projects across Wales. And the title of his paper is Reaping What We Have Sown, The Reap, we've already heard of Reap today, the Race Equality Action Plan, project in Welsh Museums 2021-22, so very hot off the press there. Our second speaker is Darren Macy. Darren is a lecturer at the University of South Wales and is a heritage manager for Honmakan on Tap. He is a historian and he speaks regularly on black history in South Wales. He specialises in civil rights and on the significance of black histories to modern day Wales. He is a member of the Executive Committee of FABIR, the Welsh People's History Society, who is co-sponsoring this conference. And the title of his paper today is Proud Valleys, Wales and Atlantic Activism. And our third speaker is Anne Rainsbury, curator for Monmouthshire Museums. And her interests lie in uncovering hidden history, including women's and black history. And she's committed to keeping local stories alive in the community. But her interests spread well beyond the local and her specialist subject for many years has been Nathaniel Wells, 
a mixed-race Caribbean plantation owner who lived in South Wales. And speaking on this, she has appeared on BBC programmes such as David Olsoga's Forgotten Slave Owners and very recently, Britain's Black Past. And today she brings a whole raft of new information to us as she extends her research on this, on this subject beyond the core subject of Nathaniel. And the title of her paper is Navigating a Moral Maze, Nathaniel Wells, Wider Family Stories and Wales. And our fourth and final speaker is Gaynor Legal. Um, Legal, is it? Legal. Legal. Gaynor was born and brought up in Cardiff and grew up in the culturally diverse port area known as Tiger Bay. She's been an activist fighting for diversity and race equality for many, many years. And, well, from her, her entire life. She was Wales's first black councillor and she's on the board of several organisations across Wales, including Diverse Excellence Cymru, Banzo, and she currently chairs the Heritage and Cultural Exchange, which chronicles the story of Tiger Bay and its rich diversity and brings it to the world. She advocates for ethnic minority women across Wales and has recently been given the Lifetime Achievement Award by the Ethnic Minority Welsh Women's Achievement Association. Um, and she speaks to us today on the groundbreaking audit of statues and memorials in Wales associated with slavery and empire. This was a Welsh Government initiative. We've heard so much about what the Welsh Government is doing at the moment, which Gaynor chaired. And I was very honoured to have been one of the working group um, that put that audit together. And I can honestly say that without Gaynor's superb chairing, the audit would not be the excellent document that it is now. Now, all four speakers will be delivering their papers, and then after which we'll be having our question and answer session. So, on to our first speaker, Peter Alexander. Thank you very much. much more apparent uh, in the last few years, the links that Wales has with the history of slavery, colonialism and empire. Uh, from slaveholders of the great estates, such as the penance of Penryn, to the industries that depend on the products of empire, such as the Iron Master, John Wilkinson's works of Bersham. The British Empire created Wales that became integrated into the imperialist capitalist system. And that's why you've sort of got a miniature history of Wales all in, in one. So from uh, iron axes to copper mirrors. The question that arises from the history, from a heritage perspective, is how much of that history is represented in the collections of Welsh museums and how it is interpreted. Now, the, we've already heard about REAP, Race Quality Action Plan, well, the REAP project was a groundbreaking project designed to develop and influence a pilot for local museums in Wales to facilitate understanding of how their collect collections are connected to slavery and empire. So, you know, REAP, REAP called the Action Plan, an innovative plan by the Welsh Government that was produced to, you know, produced to work as for an anti-racist Wales by 2030. Now, the idea of the project was to provide museum staff with the skills and to embed the knowledge of their collections into their strategies and working practices and help them develop engagement opportunities with diverse stakeholders. It addressed the need identified in the Wales Race Equality Action Plan and the programme for government that is, quote, to ensure the history and culture of our black, Asian and minority ethnic communities are properly represented by investing further in our cultural sector and museum network. So with the backing of the Welsh Government, the programme was to consist of two strands. Uh, the main strand was training on collections interpretation, carried out by project leader Marion Gwynn and Audrey White. Wait. Oh, sorry, it was all 
Um, both of whom are sharing the panels today, and two of our special speakers are also here today, um, who are Gabriel Vidal and Michael Hongju. Over 60 local museums in Wales participated in their online courses. We also needed to know, of course, what the museums that engaged with the project actually held in their collections. What was linked to the subject of slavery and empire? Welsh museums were approached to be part of the project and we were delighted at the response. And it was planned that eight museums would be part of this original pilot project. More were both willing and able within the time frame to become engaged, but unfortunately not all could in the end be actually accommodated in that time. So, on the whole, the museums were spread throughout Wales, mostly to give an indication of countrywide collections rather than concentrating in one area. Eventually three, North, two Mid and three South Wales museums took part, and we hope in future developments will see more museums that were not able to be part of the final eight become engaged with a new phase of the project. Now, it was my part of the project to investigate what the museums held in their collections. That meant I would visit each museum, spending two days in each research, researching their collections. The research consisted of searching the museum's catalogues, both digital and on paper. Sometimes what was in the collections, computer databases, uh, did not give all the information that you would find in their, um, their paper catalogues and in their accession registers. So while, while using the databases, the terms that were searched for were not only those that were linked directly to slavery, words such as empire, slave, slavery, imperial, although those are all good places to start, um, but looking at places, looking for places that are associated with empire, such as Jamaica, and Kenya, um, sometimes just, these were sometimes collected under collective terms such as West Africa, East Africa, the West Indies. But these are would also reveal links that lead to artefacts that would lead to new stories. Similarly, with the empire being about trade, the next series of searches were connected to products of empire and being aware of the history that each museum interprets and the links to other areas of Wales and Britain that were the agents for search. It was important to do some research prior to each visit on the local history of the area that each museum covered. And it was also important to have help from the staff in these museums who knew their collection and, and had some local knowledge uh, that might not be found in published sources. And this is where people such as Anne Rainsbury, who we'll hear from later, became completely invaluable. Um, so, looking at products of empire, for instance, a search for copper, there's an important product of empire in Wales for its use in shipbuilding, as well as its use in triangular trade by environmental and saved Africans, can lead to links with, say, the mines at Paris Mountain Iron the Sea, or to copper processing centres in Swansea. When searching for these links and collections, one must be aware of the main products of empire, such as tea, tobacco, sugar and coffee, as well as spices or exotic woods, such as ivory, mahogany, and other animal products. One specific, one specific people and locations and companies are revealed, clumped to have colonial collections. A further search was made concentrating on these names to reveal other stories and other artefacts. So these built up to create a complete picture of what each museum held in its collections. So, while I cannot at this present time name each museum that took part, as each report that was delivered to each museum was confidential, I can reveal some of the findings of the collections investigation part of the project. So obviously here you might uh, recognise as um, a trade token, in this case from Bershaw. Is that yeah. Yeah. No, no. From, from where? Bershaw. So the first statement must be made that is that every museum contained a colonial collection. 
every museum had colonial links. In one instance, items may have been mislabeled. Um, this happened many years ago, in the 1920s in one case. But in some cases, staff were not aware of the extent of their colonial collections, simply because looking for those links were not in their remit or the very first of their interpretation. Nevertheless, the collections and the links are there. Artifacts linked to slavery include trade tokens. Items show just how deep into society the imperial system penetrated. Industrialists, industrialists with slave capital controlled where their workers shopped, chained them to the imperial system. The artworks of Bersham, where this uh, token comes from, um, relate to the Iron Master uh, John Wilkinson. And Wilkinson's works produce the rollers, and the rolls need to crush sugar cane and other items that were actually directly linked to the machinery of slavery. Um, John Wilkinson went into business with Anthony Bacon, and Bacon had slave wealth. So his investment was vital to Wilkinson's um, ironworks. Um, Wilkinson also created a cannonballing machine and bought a share in the Mona Mine at Paris Mountain, and shares in Williams Industries of Hollywell, Flintshire, as well as lead mines at Manila and Sufi. Copper was used to make manilas for the buying of enslaved Africans, and lead and copper were used in sugar producing and refining processes. So, look at those uh, manilas. And I'm going to take it that a lot of people here do actually know what a manila is. Is there anybody who does not? One, just a couple. Um, these are the, these items here, which are made from copper. These little things that look like, you know, more like tall horseshoes. And they have one use and one use only. They were used as ballast in ships that were going south on the the trade to Africa. And when they came to Africa, these were used to buy the slave Africans. That's their only use. And these were made in Wales. Um, their production in Wales, their one of them used, can be problematic for interpretation as well as their identification. Um, in this instance, um, they had been misidentified in the 1920s as African bangles. Um, although it is noticed that they were made in Britain, it was uh, complicated because. These are the millers here, and they are displayed directly next to genuine African jewellery here. <laughs> yes. Um, and in another instance, they are displayed in another museum, um, and correctly named, but beyond a simple um, naming of copper manillas, they are not interpreted at all. Telling any history, primary sources are valuable, and there are many throughout most museums. Um, one collection contained letters from a plantation worker in the years just before emancipation. Now, these letters are a valuable resource for interpreting the most links to slavery, um, and statistics in them, their income, size of populations of estates, are good information, but the re reveal also personal attitudes and the treatment of the enslaved workers on the estates which show the cruelty of the slave economy and I'm about to show you the um, transcription of this letter. Um, I warn you that in some cases it can be a bit triggering. Is anybody, can anybody read that? Yeah. I'll give you just a minute to have a look at that. Everyone had a read? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So, this is a collection of letters that is held in a museum. It's amazing, isn't it? Actually, that they're not. It's almost like wishy-wishy. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Yes, your dutiful grandson. Um, the products of empire are also very well represented from uh, ornate uh, Indian silver, in this case, such as this jewellery box, um, in the shape of a fully articulated, that fish is fully articulated, it is something of fish wood, very beautiful. Um, but it is made of Indian silver, as is a lot of silver in this political collection. Tea, coffee, tobacco, spices, sugar, all of your products are represented in the scores of artefacts. Um, tea caddies, crockery, kitchen items, sugar tongs, sugar cutters, teaspoons, simply, simply endless tea sets. Um, all aspects of a growing imperial economy. Um, the fact that so many museums um, are showing life in an ordinary house in Wales, mostly during the 18th and 19th century, have these artefacts show how integrated all levels of society were in profiting even a small or indirect way from the growth of empire and the efforts to maintain the imperial system. Now, each museum collects artefacts, photographs, documents relating to the part that local people played in the upkeep of the empire, even if these are viewed through the prism of service and sacrifice, in the, armed forces, <coughs> in the armed forces, and the need to record these stories, especially those that relate to the two world wars, that were the convulsions that shaped the history of the last century, has led to military collections that also reflect the extent of the British Empire and the immense resources employed in its maintenance. And although these collections include many photographs of mainly men in foreign fields, as we have here, um, there are also uh, collections that reflect the actions of their forebears in claiming those fields, um, which are also shown in collections of trophies of those defeated local populations. Now we can look for many colonial collections, even in natural history collections. Um, many of these Collections are symptomatic of a certain worldview that existed in Britain, certainly in upper middle classes before the shock of the First World War, and he carried on even in the twilight of empire. As a world empire, it was the opportunity for those who could travel to bring the world, or at least its, its, uh, its natural uh, collections um, and their cultural offerings to Britain. Um, the exotic mania among the upper middle classes led to collections of exotic birds, eggs, and insects in particular. However, even where these items are not from overseas or from British, British colonies, what we must be aware of is provenance. Provenance is so important. One collection of natural history was donated by a certain William Lyons. And William had been left a thousand pounds in the will for his father, John Lyons, who was a plantation owner in Antigua. And although William did not inherit the estate, being a younger son, he nevertheless benefited from the family ownership of the estate and its slaves. His collection is not alone being donated by a person whose family links to the profits of empire allowed them the opportunities in time and resources to collect, create large collections. In searching for colonial links in museums, provenance is as important as the material and historical link of each object in isolation. This is why the collection's investigation was necessarily in depth rather than just reporting on items on their own terms. In any future investigation of these collections, it must look deeper into the provenance of these collections than the two days in this case allowed it for the week project allow, so for the week project. Um, so, uh, back here, um, and those essentially are the minerals that are labelled but not interpreted, right next to the axis. So, in conclusion, the collections investigation shows that Welsh museums are well placed 
to interpret Wells' links to the history of slavery, colonialism and empire. Artifacts exist in the collections of local museums all around the country that point to the engagement of Welsh people in the imperial system. Those that engage in the training sessions run by Marion and Audrey have the knowledge. They are also now aware of the extent of their colonial collections. We are now in the planning stages to support museums in Wales as they move forward with communities of all heritage to reinterpret their collections. And the project has been a leader in giving these museums the capacity to do this and we aim to carry on this work in a future development from the REAP project. Thank you very much. Despite the start of the day, I think everybody who spoke so far and the questions have been absolutely fantastic. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Crowd Valley, which is a, a project about Atlantic activism, um, which, um, which we are about three quarters of the way through. Uh, a little bit about me. So, I, I'm the operational manager of Rhonda Kinnataf's Health and Services. Rhonda Kinnataf is the third largest local authority in Wales. We've got three accredited museums within our borders, approximately, I think it's about 280,000 people. We service also quite a wide range in authority, quite quite a lot of people we can influence. Hopefully, my other day job as a history and sociology lecturer at the USW influences the one job and one job influences the other. My uh, I lecture in history and sociology mainly on heritage. So uh, my my students finish by producing a, a critical heritage guide, uh, which I either use as methodology of critical race theory or collective memory. So they have really got engaged with the topic. A uh, bit of a disclaimer to start. If I say anything you like and you really respect, I work for Rhonda Kevin <laughs> If I say anything controversial, which sparks a bit of debate, I work for USW. <laughs> <laughs> and my main motivation for all of this is this young lady here. That's my goddaughter, Maya. Uh -huh. Maya drives me on to push and keep pushing on this and try and get those 280,000 in RCT to understand what we're doing. You know, and to take this beyond academia, beyond the museum sector, and in, into homes, into conceptualizations, into that collective memory. So, Maya is my inspiration. We'll come back to Maya at the end. Um, but there's a few English people here today. So, that, that's a Welsh thing, which really means to be a leader, you need to be a bridge. And that's what I aim to do. I aim to connect people up. I aim to use as many different organizations to get a, my message or our message or narrative across. To, to as many people as I can. Um, in terms of this project, first thanks is to, is to, to the Fed, who funded it. I think we've got £8,000 funding for this, which, which uh, translates to a, an exhibition at the end, an online exhibition, some materials for teachers, well, I'll come back to that, some materials for students, and also some, some training sessions for, for, for uh, educational professionals. Um, I've had students from Cardiff University working on this. That actually, I had a brilliant MA student from Cardiff who hijacked RCT's um, social media feed on Paul Wilson's birthday on the 9th of, 9th of April and, and kind of posted lots of different stuff and we tweeted on. So we, we got really good traction from that. Uh, also, obviously, my students at the University of South Wales, uh, Sean's in here. Where's Sean? Miners Library. So Sean's provided us with some research and some, some materials from the Miners Library. This goes on and on. Glamorgan Archives, so we have had students from the Church of the Glamorgan Archives looking at, at Neil's special subject, his uh, uh, race rights in 1919. Uh, this young lady, she's been really supportive right through this. You're not really studious there, Marion. I know, first time ever. And obviously, you know, my staff as well. I've got to give my staff a really big mention because I've got uh, two new staff. I've got Nora as officer, and I've also got a new collections manager. I've, my boss at RCT really invests in what we do. We've got two educational specialists, which, which you've, met, you've met the wonderful Esther, who works with years. She's my work daughter, Esther. If you can imagine me in a dress, actually, you don't really want to imagine me in a dress. 
for that process. It's pretty amazing and obviously our inspiration. <laughs> Which, yeah, I've had lots and lots of conversations with Shana and she really has inspired me to, to push, push on with this. Um, so we started this project originally. We did a, a, a mirror project of what, what Gaynor did with the, the audit. I was uh, commissioned by RCT to put, do an RCT specific one. Uh, those are all my students who work with from USW. Uh, just in case anybody doesn't know where Roma kind of Taff is, that's where we are, right down in the south. Uh, so it, yeah, it's a horrendous journey to this wonderful, wonderful place. But so it's, a, it's a big local authority, and we split the three different areas. That's, that's the, the Ronda, Canon, and Taff. So I, I actually live in the, Ronda, the wonderful Ronda Vach. So uh, history on the edge. These are my students' comments. Uh, I, I want, we can go back, I'm quite conscious, I've only got 20 minutes, and, and you're going to have to hook me off here, because I'll keep talking. And talking, <laughs> and talking. So I, I, I won't read them out loud, and I'll leave you, give a couple of sets and read them. Every single one of those students is now doing a PGC. So they've now taken what we've done with them, and they've taken that, and you can see the opinions that we need the memorialization needs to be considered, we need the knowledge past injustices, so we have planted those seeds. So how, how, how many uh, children of those students can influence when they pass it, when they do to the PGC, a PGC? How many students are going to run through past it? it it's quite inspiring to again, I suppose it's that moment of poking finger in, in, a, in a still pond and seeing the ripples. The ripple effect, this is absolutely massive. This is where child is really like, education is so important. Um, the only problem we found, really, uh, and I, I won't go and talk about the, the audit because you know, gain and whack it on the year if I do. But, but the, only, the only real problem we found was, was a plaque to um, Lord Aberdeer, which is in Monkey House Comprehensive. Um, it should stay in Monkey House Comprehensive, <coughs> despite there being issues around Lord Aberdeer, and I won't elaborate on the chair of it. The, uh, the major company, but was also chair of Royal Ge Geographic Society, and it is complex, but it's in a school. So that's where it should be. So we should be working with those children in that school to put context around this, to say, well, this plaque is there. It's problematic. Is it problematic? So we can have a discussion around it. One thing I have got a problem with is 2012, that plaque was erected. Now, I think for me, memorialization, again, this is, this is gaining a speciality. There's three points. There's with person when, uh, when the person's acting. There's the point it was memorializing now. That is far too... Far too near to where we are now to be memorialising Bruce and suggest. But there we go. Because, you know, come back there, 2012, Chris, my colleague, good friend, and I collaborated, collaborated with Chris on a number of projects. Chris Evans, Chris is publishing Slave Wales in, in 2010. You know, Daniel, I've worked with, Daniel actually is feeding into this, uh, the uh, Pro Valley project. Uh, we, I think uh, Charlotte mentioned Dan, both these books actually. So that, that is around the period that this has been erected in Mount Denise Comprehensive. Chris, Chris lives in Hopkinstown, which is around four or five miles from where our plaque is. You know, Hopkinstown is, Chris is just a couple of, I don't know, two or three miles away from me. So the, the context and the academic time lag as well. Chris is writing this in 2010, and you know, um, Charlotte, Neil, and, and Paul uh, producing Torrent Wales, you know, even before that. You know, I, I, only now we're having these conversations, again, so as Charlotte mentioned, you know, why, why isn't there no post-Brexit? So I suggest, why, why isn't this in the public consciousness? And I, there were a couple of articles around slave wheels at the time, but it's not in the public consciousness, so we need, we need to push that. Um, what I did find was, was a, a lack, a lack of a voice, a lack of, of uh, any engagement with black history in, in Roman Kinnataf. Now, there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, the chronology of the growth, or the demographic growth in my area is probably late 1830s onwards, and you know, obviously the, the coal industry. So there's not that much of an overlap with, with, the, with the slave trade. There's a massive overlap with, obviously, uh, um, you know, the, the empire was, was powered by coal from, from my area. But th th there's not a massive overlap, so we haven't really gone in old collections lots of engagement with the slave trade empire slightly, but, but not, not as much. But what we didn't have is any engagement at all with black history. Uh, if you're not familiar with this generalist, this is Moses Roper. Moses Roper is, is uh, uh, a former slave, 
who would travel extensively across the UK, specifically quite lofty in Wales. He publishes his slave narrative in, in the uh, in late 1830s in Welsh. There are 7,000 copies. It was 7,000 copies of his slave narrative. Speaks in, uh, and there's a brilliant uh, website, Frederick Douglass, uh, if you can Google that, which tracks all uh, Frederick Douglass, Moses Roper, and, and lots of other uh, former slaves who gave their narratives right across Britain. Moses Roper spoke right across North Wales, spoke right across Mid Wales. In my area, he spoke in Mountain Ash, in uh, Chicanan. You know, right. So I suggest Moses Roper is a brilliant engagement for schools. You can trace through this website a local, area, a local area where Moses Roper spoke, spoke in, in your locality. So that's great for schools. So you engage our schools, Welsh schools specifically, because you know, it's, an artist is, is published in Welsh. So that's what I want to engage with. I want to engage with those thousands of, of British people who stood in halls and listened to these slave narratives in the 1830s, 1840s, um, engaged with emancipation, engaged with abolitionism, and stood shoulder to shoulder with, with these former slaves. That's what I want to engage with. That's what I want to remind these communities about. Yeah, a more rounded engagement. So there you are again, Charlie. So I knew I'd be sitting next to you, so that's what <laughs> so, so how do we engage with these, these children? That handsome young chap. He <laughs> looks familiar. That's me. So how, I, 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 I stripped this back and thought, well, how, how did I engage with history when I was in school? I certainly didn't engage with, I went to, I went to comprehensive school in, I think it was, yeah, it was, in September 1980. So 1982, that's the Mary Rose coming up. Absolutely no interest, no engagement at all. I'm also dyslexic, so the, the history teacher stands at the front of the room dictating to me, meant absolutely nothing. My history, what I really engaged with them and what perked my interest and started me researching at 12 years old was that. That's, that's, if you've never listened to UB40 signing off, I suggest download it, buy the album, go and see, go and see the band. Because I you learned more about history and engagement, certainly black history, from that album than I did anything else I learned in school. So I, le I learned about Martin Luther King. I learned about Gary Tyler and his imprisonment. I learned about the British Empire. I learned about, you know, there's a line in there that said, you know, our, our government funding, you know, the South, South African regime. You know, burden of shit, fantastic. That made that little fresh-faced child at the top go out research, go to the local library, no Google there, of course. Go to the local library, engage with these things. Gary, Gary, there's a line we get it in Tyler. He's been in prison for five years, 41 years. In prison, 41 years. You know, the King's a really brilliant song as well. And obviously engaging, you know, I, I come from a South Wales coal field. The early 80s, you know, unemployment, that my dad was unemployed, but, you know, my, all my community really engaged with, with the mining. So, um, so fast forward and then to the day job now, this is what I'm interested in, in collective memory, and also collective memory comes, comes from amnesia. Coming back to schools, I do quite a lot of outreach schools and uh, work in schools. I was also a secondary school teacher for a couple of years. And the only thing I do now with the current A-level curriculum is talk about Martin Luther King, which is fine, but it's in isolation. It's, it, the the A-level question in Wales is, uh, how important was Martin Luther King to, to, to the civil rights movement? So all these other individuals, and that's a very gendered photograph. I didn't take the photo. But all those individuals and lots of other individuals were part of that civil rights movement and constantly say The other thing I'd say about Moses Roper, I'm not even talking about Paul Robeson, they are symptomatic of wider movement, so we need to be careful that we didn't just talk about individuals. And we, we put those individuals in the context of the movements they were part of, or the, in fact, in Robeson's uh, case, the movements they initiated. But they've got to be put in that context. It can't be just about individualism. What we do for time? So I'll keep going to You've, you've, you've got to. Okay. Um, the, the other thing, I, I try, try to translate it uh, through this project, is the idea of not subservience, the idea of fighting back, the idea that the black history is not about, about simply about um, oppression, it's about struggle. It's about people who are oppressed struggling to, to free themselves from that oppression. You know, and you know, Charlotte makes a brilliant point. You know, we've got to understand, we've got to translate local 
to, 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 to grow. But Haiti would be a brilliant example of that. You know, if I was teaching sociology students today about Haiti, so if you look at the Haitian Revolution and look at the state of Haiti now, one of the poorest countries in the world, why? You know, and I suggest that is still an impact of that. Uh, Frederick Douglass, you know, again, fighting back, and you know, next one, which would be Moses Roper as well. But, which brings me on to Paul Robeson. Uh, Paul Robeson is pretty iconic in, in the area I come from. Um, uh, again, direct quote from Robson. It's the miners of South Wales that first made me understand the struggle between Negro and white together. So Robson has been a, um, a really influential figure in, in my life for, for, for most of it. Certainly since I started doing some research at, at, at 12 and 13 or 14. I started reading about Robson because I was interested in music as well and his connections to Wales. And, I, and we could spend the next couple of hours just talking about Paul Robson and, and his connections to Wales. But I think we only talk about certain sections of that connection as well. I think that's is that one of you, Sean. So that's, that's from the South Wales Mines, I think. But so what we don't talk about, that's, that's Mark Rhodes. Um, Mark Rhodes did um, lots of these talks as well. I think for Clavier. Yeah? Lots of the talks are uh, on the Clavier website. There's a series of talks over the last couple of years you can, you can download and you can, you can, you can walk them. I did one on Robson with, which included, included Mark, and, and Mark's hypothesis is there's lots of facets of Robson, Robson are memorialised, but not his anti-colonialism and not his work in, in Africa. And I think we need to perhaps engage with that. But if, but if we can engage the first bit, if we can get people understanding that they are standing shoulder to shoulder with, or, Historically, in 1830s, 1840s, people in my area should show their show and say, oh, we, need, we need to abolish slavery in America and fought with that. And also, you know, the way Paul Robeson supported Welsh miners in the 20s and 30s, and the way that the miners in my area, not just miners, but minor, minor communities, supported Robeson in his fight against McCarthyism and the removal of his uh, passport. Um, as part of the project, as well, I've also worked with Anon. Anon is absolutely brilliant. Young graphic designer and artist, she's on her last year of her degree at USW. So, what Arnold's done is taken part of our research and really took it in completely different directions. And again, this was mentioned earlier about multidisciplinary, about linking up with other groups and doing different things. So, Arnold is a process of con constructing um, a lot of different images, and we're doing two different exhibitions. One, one which would be pretty factual about Robson. And the other one, which would be a bit more abstract, a bit more engaging. Um, there, there are some challenges around Robson, you know, Robson's the, um, connections with the Soviet Union, but, but this, is, this is contested history, this is, this is rounded. But I'm really keen to move this, move all these discussions out to this kind of forum and get it out to the public and get people engaging with it. Um, outcomes. So um, I mentioned we created, uh, I think it's a 21-page booklet, uh, which, which will give a bit of a breakdown of, of the Atlantic slave trade, talk about um, from 1492 onwards, you know, the, the, the joint um, rise of capitalism and racism as a justification for exploitation in terms of capitalism. And again, I, I've got to tread quite carefully because if we are a local authority, and we can't seem to be politicised. And on the subject of local authority, going back to your question, and I think that's the level of government you should be, should be um, um, not attacking the wrong word, but engaging with. You know, I, I think that's a structure of government with which people do, don't engage with. So we should be connected up. You know, our museums, schools, um, also learning establishment, the universities, they should, we should be the overarching people you know, engaging and, and correcting people up. That, that's what I'm trying to do. At the moment, I'm probably quite the lonely fellow because I've got, because I've got a couple of different feet in a couple of different um, areas, you know, as, as, as a professional historian and a heritage professional, or also um, um, the, the other engagements I've got with Clavia, that gives, affords me maybe a bit of an overview, but there are plenty of other people in the sector doing this, a similar thing, so we just need to connect that. But maybe local authorities is, I don't know, we just had a, a pretty good set of results, so how good is it? I've just been asked if we find uh, probably the last local authority school in the whole of Oxfordshire. 
So we're going to do it to cover my suit. So we'll, <laughs> see, we'll see which academy you get. <laughs> if, if you were in Wales, I'd be saying to you, it doesn't matter whether you, you're a tax or local authority, you need to be leaning on museums, you need to be leaning on, yeah, on, on universities to, 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 to create this new crypto. See, I, I keep going. I keep going. <laughs> Te teaching support, that's really important. So we, we're going to do workshops with teachers. I, 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 I stood in front of a group of uh, children, I thought, well, I'm talking about, I'm talking about music. I don't really know much about music, but that, that's the nature of teaching at the moment is people are rolled out and say, don't perform. So we, we're going to support teachers, we're going to do workshops with teachers, engage with head teachers first, but they're the ones with the money. We don't have any money for them. Community engagement, we want to get out in the community, we want to um, set up workshops, uh, engage with local, lots of local history groups, but away from local history groups as well. You know, I, I posted that I was, I was talking today, and I, I immediately, well, what about white history? What about is it? You know, and that, yeah, I, I replied, but I engaged with the conversation, because it's easy to delete, so you're an idiot, you know, you know. You've, you've got to engage with these people, you've got to try and persuade them, however difficult it is to keep your temper, right? you've, got, you've got to engage. Because we are all, we are, you know, we sing in the quiet. Everybody in this room agrees with, with our topic, agrees that we've got to move forward. There are plenty of people out there who have been fed, I'll come back to my, you know, they've been fed, they've been fed this narrative. I reviewed um, Ch uh, Shireen's book just before lockdown. Fantastic, it is a blueprint, a blueprint, a blueprint sorry. Powell's speech is a blueprint to everything that's going on since. It's a blueprint for that person in the bottom corner. That's, they've, got, they've got a really strong narrative. We need to get a really strong narrative there. I've got to persuade Maya, when she grows up, that, that she's a bright, intelligent, Welsh woman of colour. It's fantastic. But I've got to persuade everybody else in our class that they stand shoulder to shoulder with Maya. Maya's not different. My is part of the same community. The otherness is our problem. That's what that's what create is created. This narrative of otherness. And I, I fight against this every day. And it is out there. I mean it's it's galling coming from the South Wales Valleys where sorry I'm getting a bit wound up. <laughs> where where you know men picked up a gun in the thirties and went out and ran a fort in Spain. Now you I hear this. Why what, what about white history? It just yeah. just I, I wanna I would just get really angry. You can't. The calm down and say, well, no, we've got, we've got, we've got a shared cause. You've obviously seen my teaching style. Because <laughs> <laughs> no, it is massively obsessive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I teach at the end of Brighton North Runway, basically. So we've got a lot of military kids. And you get huge influxes and outfluxes. And you get... Sorry, could we keep the discussion short? Sorry, sorry. Because yeah. 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 we, we do have two other speakers. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I, Manny and Obi, I'll go on. But yeah, just, just, to, just to sum up in a couple of words, it, it, we've got to provide an answer. We've, we've, we've got... We've got you know, demographically, you know, my, my area is not that diverse, but I, I need my area growing up in an area which, which identifies with her, and she identifies with an area. You know, she, 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 she's actually the apple of my head. You know, and, and that's what drives me on to, to, to speak to those 280,000 people and try to engage with them. Much as I love engaging with everybody in this room, much as I love teaching, much as I know how important it is creating leaders for the future, it's, it's, it's persuading those people out there there's a shared heritage. And that shared heritage might not be in terms of numbers, but it's in terms of solidarity. So it, that, that's what the idea of Atlantic activism. So, sorry if I ran over a bit. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. You see the passion of the South Wales Bowls. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And I'd like to now welcome our third speaker, who is Anne Rainsbury. Just getting a presentation for her here. One, I'm going to read so that I can try to keep to time. Two, um, that sadly, there is a lot of pictures of 
white middle-aged men in this somehow, but that says an awful lot about the record and what we don't have as well as what there is. So, um, as Marion said before, I've been working and researching the family <coughs> Wells and his wider story for some time. The headline story of the family Wells is now well known. The son of a wealthy plantation owner on St. Kitts and one of his enslaved African house servants, Nathaniel was sent as a child of nine to be educated in Britain and inherited the lion's share of his father's fortune when he came of age in 1800. Married and bought Piersfield near Chepstow, hence my interest, famed for its walks and views over the Wye Valley. His wealth, education, and status as a country estate owner enabled him to hold public offices, deputy lieutenant, magistrate, and high sheriff of the county, the first person of black heritage to do so. Also lieutenant in the local yeomanry cavalry militia, another first. All of these offices would have been closed to him if he had returned to St. Kitts. Even as a free black, he could not have even sat on a jury, let alone sat in judgment, could not sit in the same pew as a white person, let alone act as church warden, could not even vote. He would have been seen as a threat to the white plantocracy power base. And yet back in Britain, he could rise and apparently be accepted by the same society that created the brutally divided world of the West Indies. On one level, it can be read as a, as a success story, a tale of achievement.